Good evening, and welcome to another Friday Night Roundtable with Ed Tolinius at WPLO and Jesse Outler of the Atlanta Constitution. And, and myself and you guys, I guess this is the last shot. We went 18 months in a week, and now they tell us that we don't go anymore as this station gets completely out of the sports business. Well, that's pretty long run anyway, right? Well, well, <laughs> well yeah, if you're going to talk old vaudeville talk yeah, from back in the 30s, yeah, that's kind of a long run. Well, a good run. A lot of them, they make a pilot and never get on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we started that first week way back there, whatever that football season was in 79, I guess. Yeah. Flashing the odds up on the board and uh, and uh, immediately got in trouble because Georgia went and lost three in a row. <laughs> but it sure was a great beginning. You know, of all the guys we've had up here, and there were circumstances around some of them. What do you think was the best interview we had? Was it Pepper right after they fired him? Pepper Rogers. Was it Hubie Brown? Pepper Rogers and Hubie would be pretty good. Be my think that'd be a tie? Uh, Hubie was in a rare mood. Yeah. Uh, Criticized his own men, remember? Yeah, and I remember none of us got many questions in, which was fine, great, as long as he had something to say. And I think we all said afterwards that's the first time we'd ever heard him openly criticize oh, yeah. his players. There was a little weekly paper, one of these many weeklies in the area, Marietta or someplace, and some guy, and they sent this to me in the mail, wrote that our show with Hubie Brown, this is many months ago, as you know, many, many months ago, was the greatest piece of journalism he had ever seen on television. If I had to pick one to film uh, to retain or pursue an air, I think that would be it. You missed, you missed a good one one night, though. What? Now, he knew all about Bo Bach knew about the personality and the pushiness and this sort of thing, you yeah. know. But he'd never worked with him. <laughs> so you're gone somewhere, and here comes Bo. And we got about three minutes into it, and Bo was ripping Georgia Tech and everybody who had ever even been there. But Pepper, Curry, anybody, just ripping everybody, <laughs> and old Jesse got after him. And I sat there in a the chair and leaned back and shut up for about six, seven minutes, and those two got after each other. We had a pretty good debate about Pepper, didn't we? <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> Jesse sorry, got red. Oh, that. yeah, Jesse got mad at him, and Bo kind of hollers anyway. And it was just, it was really a great show, and we had a lot of phone calls on that one. I still think Pepper was a very good coach. Bo doesn't think so. We were debating on Oh, yeah, no, oh, I do too. <laughs> and I think Pepper was a great recruiter, you know, uh, at least. It's like Bobby Dodd. When you were at a Super Bowl once, uh, Ed and I were sitting here. We had Dodd. And Dodd shocked the fool out of me by saying, uh, Pepper did a good job recruiting blacks. Well, and, the pros uh, prove that. He's got, like, 16 of them in the pros. Oh, I'll tell you what. He really did a job. Most of those 16 of them <laughs> played for him. I never understood how he got that stud Eddie Lee Ivory away from all the schools that were looking at him and got him in touch. You know, speaking of Pepper, I wonder if he lost a little of his enthusiasm for coaching in the latter years. I don't know. I don't know. I, somehow I got that impression when I talked with him that... <clears throat> he did lose a lot of his intensity, whether it was yeah. from criticism of the alumni or for whatever the reason, you've got a good point there. And he got into the last year and he, uh, he shifted well, he, you and know, changed the circumstances considered. Um, he wasn't as gung-ho as he first was. He did something I thought Pepper would never do. He conformed or tried to that last season. Well, he even threw his wishbone. He threw his wishbone. He got rid of the wishbone. He got rid of the whiskers. He quit riding the motorcycle, and maybe that's what happened to him. Maybe well, he should have kept on being Pepper. <laughs> oh, that's a good point. I'll tell you that. Well, he's going back to being Pepper now, as you well know. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. I'll never forget the night Jerry Glanville sat here, the Falcons defensive coach, and I got to talking about Florida had just switched to the run and shoot, and they'd hired this guy from Minnesota to put it in and that. Glanville knew the run and shoot offense, upside down, inside out, had been involved with it, had been teaching other teams at a fee on how to defend against it, knew all the people in Portland State where it had started, he knew all about the so-called run and shoot, and that really surprised me. Glanville's easy to work with. Yeah, you know, we had some real good shows. Lehman Bennett was good up here, Norman Brocken was, man. Oh, well, Van Brocken uh, was real good. Bill man. Curry, when he first got the job, very good show. Uh, yeah. Had some, uh, Talking about Glanville. He's one of the sharpest defensive minds I've ever known. I think so. Right along with Bud Carson. Well, Bud Carson told me there when he had Glenville at Georgia Tech, he says, this guy knows as much defensive football as most anybody. He's going to be a great coach. Well, Bartkowski said, I think, toward the end of the season, that somebody asked why the Falcons played so much better second half. And he said, because of the coaching staff. He said, we go in that halftime, and they got this stuff figured out, and we make whatever adjustments need to be made, and then we go back out, and it works. Glanville said something here one day that, you know, he had to 
I think he was over on the other set, Jesse. We were on the phones one night, and he said that what's happened in pro football now, we've had to change our whole defensive philosophy because they changed the rules on us. So now we can't uh, coach the way we used to. We can't teach the way we used to because they've taken so much away uh, from the defense. And, and I get to thinking about Dwayne Morrison, who was probably a brilliant floor coach. Maybe yeah, as but he a, stuck. He stuck to his stuff. Maybe as fine a didn't tactician he? as anybody. You, That's Dean right. Smith, and yeah. in basketball, Durham and, and many, many others. Joe Lee yeah. have told me, and Morrison. You give him the equal material, will maybe beat anybody. In basketball, you don't have to change your philosophy. There's been no drastic overhaul of the rules. Well, the only thing we not would like to see changed in college basketball is put the shot clock in. Yeah, Ed and I, I would discussed like, I like that very four much. corner junk. I'd like to see a 30-second shot clock. And I don't know well, how I think college should have a 30-second. But I want to yes. eliminate a foul of a 30-second. I get so tired of watching people shoot fouls. That's amazing. Well, just walk up and down the court, and you got a free-throw shooting contest. Now, the, pro, the pros are worse than anything on that, though. Oh, they, and they get foul. you three to make two, you know. You, you get into a lot of that, too. I like to eliminate some timeouts, too. These coaches call timeout. Every time I look, they're having a timeout. <laughs> well, now, if you well, want to yeah. eliminate timeouts, let's take them out of those NFL games because, boy, if they don't stop that well, ball, that's ball, television. Well, I, know it's, I know it's television, I know it's television, but just the same. I believe same. it's 22 a game. But uh, like Dwayne, Dwayne Morrison, an interesting little story I heard after I'd written about it. Uh, said they were up playing North Carolina in that last game, and strange enough, Bud Carson was up there checking on some North Carolina prospects that the Rams might want to draft. Hmm. So they're on the same flight. Coming, they're on the same flight coming back. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bud had read all about it. He said, Bud walked back to Morrison's seat and says, Dwayne, make him fire. You don't quit. <laughs> yeah, <that's it. laughs> make him fire. Yeah, Dwayne resigned. And uh, I hate to see him go. Uh, I wish him the best of luck. He's yeah, quite an too. outstanding man. Yeah. And I don't know if it's, uh, who succeeds him or whoever succeeds him, whether they can win out there or not. If they, Tech is going to have to spend a lot more money to recruit if they're going to compete in the Atlantic Coast Conference. We're not, we're not going to have a disaster spring or, or summer coming, uh, are we, uh, Jesse? We got the tech coach fired. We all kind of have a hunch there's going to be one more battle royal in the Hawks front office. We aren't going to make the playoffs. We might lose our coach. And Harley Bowers down in Macon, newspaper friend of yours, he got in the, the Georgia training room and got with that trainer. And he came out yesterday with a list of all the injuries that Georgia has currently the seven or eight people who will not be able to participate in spring practice this year, five because of injuries and three because of track or baseball. And one of them, Lindsey Scott, fighting the books hard, you know, hoping to be eligible come fall. Well, all the these, dogs get in trouble. The, the one yeah, thing they, about they that, though, right. all these players are experienced players. Yeah, the injuries. Spring are. spring training is for the freshmen and for sophomores. Yeah, what, what does Herschel need spring training for? I mean, uh, <laughs> put some weight back on. He's the, lost 15 pounds. Yeah, the, uh, the <laughs> defensive uh, unit is very happy that Herschel is not going to be out of spring practice. <laughs> they won't have to be hitting him. Yeah. In. <laughs> this is a fri Friday night roundtable, and I guess it's the last shot. We'll be back with you in 60 seconds. Jesse Outler and Ed Telenius, and we all want to thank you for great comments and thousands of phone calls, I guess, the last 18 and a fraction months, and in the many small towns we all kind of move around in, and a lot even talking about the show and kidding us about the bookie odds and wondering where we got our information out of Vegas and Reno and Los Angeles and all that sort of stuff. We really do thank you for all your calls, and last night, uh, Jesse, Ed Telenius, and I sitting there on this channel, we got to talking about Georgia Tech and wondering if they'd ever 
sell out their stadium for football every home game every year as used to be the case now that uh, Alabama's the Tennessee's and the Notre Dame's are going to come off that schedule do you think they can get that program up and sell 60,000 tickets every Saturday let's say they got three ACC games and they got three others and whatever I think they can if they win Larry if they can go Curry can have some eight and nine and two year you know victories I think they can sell it out again if they can win but they're going to have to win seven eight nine and ten games because they, people will just not go see losing teams, and that's been proven right here. But if you lighten the load and take off some of the giant killers off that, the fans are going to recognize that, aren't they? Well, I think they're going to see their team beat uh, some other ACC team and lose to Alabama and Notre Dame. I think you find that true. Especially when you've been losing for such a long time. Right. Yeah. Throw that thing we got into last night about <clears throat> Georgia and Georgia Tech and Jesse. We got to wondering about the lack of importance of the game. Most unusual idea, and I don't really have the answer. Since the Tech-Georgia game no longer means anything conference-wise, because the bowl bids and all have already gone out, and they're in separate conferences now. What would be the value of starting the season for the Tech-Georgia game? What do you think about playing Georgia and Georgia Tech each year? A non-conference game, start out with it. It would be a rousing way to launch the season, I think. <laughs> a good idea. The bowl bids are out on the 14th anyway. And you can't gain anything in the final game of the year. It's not in our conference. I kind of like the idea myself. Open up the season, huh? Of course, uh, losing to Tech or Georgia, you know, the loser would have a long season right off the bat. That would be the only Well, I, against I, them. I, I said last season, night, so, I think yeah. traditionalists would never let it happen. But it does have some merit. Wouldn't you rather have Georgia playing? What if we're playing Mississippi State the final game? And we still got to win the ball game for a share of it. Yeah, it I means more. I would be great to. I would vote for two open the season. I'd go along with that. Did you two guys agree on it? We, we kind of did. We weren't sure if we had the right idea or not. But we got into this thing last night. Well, it's it's not too bad of an idea. If all, if all three of us agree on it, we'll call Curry and Dooley. I'm sure they'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> Consider it done. Well. Go ahead and make your motel reservations right now. <laughs> You know, we were talking about trends a little while ago in pro basketball. Some of the Hawks have told me that there is an interesting one developing this year in the NBA. In close games, last minute of play, last 30 seconds of play, score tied one point one way or the other, you can get away with murder. Yeah. Because the referees have apparently made up their mind, we're not going to decide the game. Yeah, I've heard that. They're killing each other, Jesse, underneath. Yeah. And uh, we lost a ball game here recently. Uh, the one that, where the Knicks took us into overtime. Where Roundfield went up to win the game in the closing seconds. No fun. With, with a layup, and this guy got both hands on his forearm. He yanked his arm down so he couldn't shoot. And we get we have to go to overtime and we get beat. They're just letting them kill each yeah, other. Yeah, they, they are doing that, definitely so. I don't like that at all. Of course, now, next year, as I understand it, the third official is coming back. Which will help. Well, it might. You know, when you and I were starting in a Southeastern Conference, if you went east with a basketball team and played St. John's or Long Island or somebody in a garden, when you set your screen or your pick, if your fanny barely bumped the guy oh, that you were screening off, you, the Eastern referee blew the whistle. Blew the whistle. Yeah, if you <clears throat> breathed on him. Man. Yeah, and now, in fact, back, <clears throat> way back in the early 40s, they had a three foot rule in the east. When you screened just, you had three feet. It wasn't that way anywhere else in America. But now, if you've seen much of the NCAAs in recent years on television, they kill each other. They allow contact oh, now yeah. that is unbelievable. It's like Harry and Mary used to say, never go east without some of your own officials. <laughs> well, I mean, any sport. <laughs> oh, that used to be, that used to be something back in the, back in the 40s <coughs> when you went to the garden. You got jobbed out of it, and I don't care how good you yeah, were. You better go kind of into talent, the, they you beat you. You better go in the last six minutes with about a 15-point minute, uh, 15 point lead. Something you can cushion. Yeah, Ed and I are talking about changes in recruiting publicity, too, from back when we were both so heavy in a conference, even way back in the 50s. All this publicity now, uh, Jesse, about the so-called blue-chip lists and gold star lists and the arguing about what school in the South. Do you remember as a young reporter breaking in anybody trying to break there. down somebody's recruiting and say who had the best of this and that thing. No, well, like, like he had said, all that information wasn't so accessible in those days because everybody didn't keep records like they do now. Every high school's got how many yards and, you know, back in those days, nobody kept a record except a few sports writers for a few teams. And 
Also, one thing I mentioned to you, the accuracy of those charts. Uh, oh, <laughs> you the check them out, about 20% uh, of those guys <laughs> are so blue chip right now, aren't very yeah. blue chip once the season starts. Well, in the last couple of years, they've gone on beyond the blue chips, uh, Jesse. Now we got a gold star, silver star. Also, the same way with the draft. An awful lot of people drafted high don't play long. Yeah. Well, I think yeah, Curry, right, uh, Coach Curry over at Tech made a good observation about that recently. He said that. Uh, they didn't sign a lot of, quote, blue chippers, but they signed players that they are sure can help them. Yeah, because you really can't tell blue chippers to those 240 and 50 pound linebackers start belting each other and yeah. uh, oh, belting yeah. those backs, then you find out about the blue chips. In other words, people are recruiting more for their type player, whatever that type but is. We've all seen so many great high school <coughs> athletes who did not come through in college. Yeah, and a lot of... Yeah. Another thing that makes Herschel so sensational, he oh, yeah. was one of the few I've known that was just even more than people thought a he lot, would be. And a lot of kids that were great offensive linemen in high school, Jesse, that we thought were big. They weighed 240 and blocked their man all yep. the time. The first time he got in a scrimmage in college, he was up against a 255 it. guy. He didn't move him it's an not inch, all that did strong he? when somebody weighs the same thing. Yeah. There's well, there's an attitude adjustment there, too. Uh, <clears throat> going from high school to college, I won't mention his name, but one of the finest running high school backs I've ever seen. He went to Athens High School back in the uh, early 50s. Everybody in the South wanted him. And George gave him a scholarship and he took it. He couldn't even make the fourth team. And who are you talking about? And then, of course, we know another example. We won't mention his name either, but... <laughs> <coughs> it's just so that they, they just here, cannot yeah. make that attitude adjustment to college life. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily physical powers. Uh, the guys that we're talking about had that. They had the equipment. It was, it was up here. They just don't get it going up here. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's no way in the world you can predicate that either. Mm -hmm. No way. And the guys just, uh, they got there and... It's true. Just uh, lost the concentration. Uh, I don't think it's so much a loss of dedication. In some cases, it is. I just say to hang with. It. Well, the Dorsey you know. kid that just left your yeah. you know, he really had high school stats, he didn't was he? Supposed and to he be. had moves. He had moves. Well, that's yeah. a lot thing. of yardage. They You're talking he... about changes, man. I tell you what, either the NBA or the NCAA has got to do something about signing underclass. I mean, undergraduates. Mm -hmm. Now that's just not fair. Now, yeah, you're that, talking about basketball, yeah. 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 Uh, NFL, man, that's it. You know, the class has got to graduate before you can be drafted. That's right. Uh, and Roselle, as I pointed out at his press conference down there, said they're going to continue that policy. Hey, how about Roselle? Now, now uh, Oakland finally did, they've actually filed those papers oh, yeah. claiming that Roselle and the owners of the Rams. It's supposed to go to trial yeah, March 26, I believe. Have been scalping tickets and pocketing a million tax free yeah. out of this thing, and that Roselle knows about it and he's allowed. Holy smokes, what if they prove that? Well, I don't think they can prove it, but they're. they're Really having the Boy, dirty, that's, dirty trial out there. That's going to be dirty. Isn't it's it? going to be very vicious. I hope they don't it's, hurt. Of course, it's a very minor thing, but I'm interested to see if the move is approved. What's going to happen to the nicknames? Oh. The Anaheim Rams. And they're the, not going to worry uh, about the nicknames. Well, that's TV is what they're all worried about. Because that's what Al Davis plans to do. Yeah, but what'll happen to the court suits too if the NFL then won't play Oakland because they moved? Well, Roselle mentioned that too. That Al Davis has to have somebody to play, and then you have a. 28 more suits. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Friday night roundtable for the final time. We'll be back with you. 60 seconds. <laughs> Friday night round table, uh, Jesse, and, <laughs> Jesse and Ed and I would like to thank the production crew here at Channel 36 for the uh, champagne 
it's it's a great way to go out. I, I tell you that, we didn't open that first football season as good as this, did we, well, Jesse? Well, a lot of people said we always apparently did drink champagne on the Friday nights or Thursday nights with picking the games on Friday or whatever. <laughs> well, you guys, here's to, here's to another uh, 18 months and one week somewhere else. Right, uh, you right. know, who knows? Cheers to everybody. Mm. Mm. That ain't bad, a big black Italian cigar and some mm. champagne. All right. That's a pretty good That's way what to call going out in class. Yeah, I sure would have been better if you'd have done this every week, Larry. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know that Wayne and Scott and Jackie were going to do this. I was about to ask you who's going to give in, the players or the owners? Or will nobody give in? Well, I think they're going to have a strike. I, I've said all the time, I think the owners want it. And I think they'll have it. Do you really? I really do. You don't think they'll, they'll make any adjustments? I think the owners really want a strike. Yeah, but we all thought that last year. I can remember 12 months ago. Eleven months ago, we sat here. We were convinced that this time they were serious. Last year, they well, were. Well, they had a year's out time, though. They had a year to think about it. Yeah. When's the last time you wrote a column out there? I know you got to write one today with, with a lot of champagne in you. Yeah, maybe it'll be better. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. I think we may see some AAA ball players. You think they do spot that? spot weekend games. You don't think people will go see that, though. You think they would? I think from the novelty standpoint, they might. What no, the, you ain't going to put 40,000 people in the stadium. What, no. if the, what if the umpire struck that oh, the immediately because we brought up minor leaguers to save it? Well, now, we'll bring up minor league umpires. The umpires struck before, and they brought up minor leaguers. Right? That's right. Let, let, me throw you, let, me throw you, let me throw you a knuckleball. A guy called in and said, uh, Necro shouldn't be getting a million a year. He says, if he's winning 29 or 30 every year, he's a Cy Young winner every year, well, we'll talk about it, he says, but nobody is. I don't right. think anybody should get a million. I don't no. Well, I don't either. Have some more champagne, nah, Jesse. We haven't, we haven't got an awful, <laughs> awful lot of time to go. We want to thank you for watching us on Friday nights, and we've had, a, we've had a pretty good shot here and a pretty good time, and we hope you didn't lose an awful lot of money each fall while we were here looking at all the odds. And we didn't make the odds. Vegas and Reno made the odds, didn't they? Right. We just picked them wrong. <laughs> the great thing all was that gold sheet out of Los Angeles that first year. You remember that? <coughs> they were always closer. And they yeah. always disagreed with the bookies, didn't they? That right. handicapped guy out there. We run out of time, and I'm sorry. And uh, maybe we'll see you again somewhere. You Thank do you. mean out of time. <laughs> yeah. have two men split. Wisham, the short man, try to run Herschel in the middle. He's got 5-10. herschel got 15. He got a block. 15-10-5. Herschel is pulled out of bounds on his arm around the two. His style is unmistakable. The energy is positively contagious. And when Larry Munson calls a ball game, it becomes more than just an athletic contest. It becomes an emotional experience. And a fumble and a pileup. And George has got the ball in the 34. The dogs were blitzing, and the quarterback dropped the ball. Kevin there is a captivating kind of honesty about Munson's broadcasts. He does not pretend to be impartial. He does not mind being called a homer. He is plain and simple a Georgia football fan who feels very strongly about his team. And on those 11 Saturdays every fall, that feeling starts building early in the day. Hours before kickoff, Munson and his crew arrive at the stadium. Their preparation process is extensive, from the electrical setup to the last-minute roster adjustments to a quick double-check on name pronunciations. This is the groundwork that has to be laid. And once the game starts, there is a complex system of hand signals used for communication between Munson and his spotters, a system every bit as intricate as those used by the coaches down on the field. And we have an official's time here for the injury. The last thing has come over. It looks chaotic, and sometimes it really gets that way, but somehow it always seems to work. 
All of that setup time, all the preparation, the silent communication in the booth, they all come together. And then Munson takes it from there. He dropped the ball, and there's a fumble, and Georgia might have the ball. Taylor over the middle, and it's intercepted by Flack. Flack back to the five. Flack fighting to the nine or the ten. And a fumble and a pile up, and Georgia's got the ball in the 34. What would you like for folks to remember you by or as? No, I don't know. I saw something that I liked in the paper this, this fall that I have never seen before. Somebody said in the paper, and I don't know what the writer was, but it was an Atlanta writer, and he called me Georgia's 12th man, and that appealed to me. That's corny, but that appealed to me. And they run a Herschel at the right tackle. He drives and spins and breaks to the 50, to the 45. There goes Herschel! There goes Herschel! There goes Herschel! should never have had more than five yards, never stumbled at least nine or ten yards of those, hit three, four times, he should have fallen down on a 50. He went 59 yards, unbelievable burst by Herschel Walker. Gosh, what a run.